So uh, hello to everybody. We are still waiting one or two minutes before starting. People are still coming in. So since uh, the beginning of August, uh, I mean, uh, the previous session, which was uh, last week, we are now using the Cassini platform. I think it doesn't make much difference for people to have access to the, to the webinar because we still, uh, it's working also with Zoom. But uh, the, what is a good point of, uh, I will say a few words about that. Uh, and we have a representative of uh, Cassini here, Ben, uh, maybe you can say a few words. So um, what is good about this Cassini platform is that uh, there, is a, there is a web page and we can put more information on the web page. And also what is very important is that each uh, with this Cassini platform now, each of the presentation is uh, official in the sense that uh, it's like a, it's like uh, publishing a paper or something. Uh, we have there is a DOI number attributed to the to the talk. So it's uh, quite uh, interesting, and I think in the future we will have more and more um, this kind of uh, this kind of presentation webinar. Which will be uh, uh, which will be considered as something very part of science itself, not just uh, like uh, an informal talk. So that's very important. And uh, I would like to remember also that uh, this uh, webinar is uh, related to the Journal of Logic Universalis. So the the talk are related with uh, papers published in the journal and also in the book series. So the universal logic, and you can find all this information on the web page on the Cassini platform, and also on the web page of the webinar, which is on the Springer website. So uh, today uh, we will have a talk by uh, Kenji Tokuo from National Institute of Technology Japan. Uh, he will speak about natural deduction for quantum logic. And as for each session of the webinar, before that, we have a presentation of an organization uh, which is related uh, for logic group, which is related with the topic or the speaker. So today it will be uh, Chris Deon, but um, there will also oh, the chair of the session today with uh, Francesco Paoli, who is member of the Federal Board of Studies in Universal Logic. So I will let him give you more detail about all that. Please, Francesco. Thank you very much, Jean-Yves. So as uh, as you said, the, um, the event will be divided in two parts. In the first part, uh, about 15 minutes, uh, uh, Christian de Ronde will present the IQSA, International Quantum Structure Association. And then uh, after a short discussion, this will be followed by a, a um, talk by Professor Kenji Tokuo, uh, which is uh, uh, related to natural deduction in, uh, in quantum logic. So let me first uh, um, introduce uh, Professor Christian De Ronde, who will uh, talk about uh, the International Quantum Structure Association, please. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm a member of the International Quantum Structure Association since 2004. And, uh, it, it's an association which congregates a lot of uh, researchers working on, on quantum logic and quantum structures in general. So this this association has is, is, is inter international. It has uh, meetings every every two years, and uh, that there are also related publications to to the association. Uh, apart from that, I, I I was going to give a talk, a, a short presentation of, of a paper on on quantum logic which is uh, an entry on, let me see if 
right here. Do you do you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So it's an entry of the uh, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and it's an <clears throat> an historical and philosophical perspective uh, on 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 quantum logic. So I I, I just wanted it's it's very short because it's just a few minutes uh give a, a survey of this of this article and uh it it it, it is kind of map an, an incomplete map as every map of uh the work that has been taking place in quantum logic and, and the development i am a physicist and as such, I, I when I when I started working on on foundations of quantum mechanics and philosophy of quantum mechanics, the my my approach was in terms of quantum logic. So, so the very first book I I I got into my hands, one of the first books I studied was uh, the the one by Yao Chen Piron, uh, and that gave me an insight which I hadn't had from from my 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 classes in physics basically because uh, it deals very specifically with the structure and the the definition of what an entity is in in, in logical terms so i i I'm, I'm just going to to go through this uh this paper this entry of the internet encyclopedia very fast just to to give some 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 ideas re related to quantum logic uh, and well, one of the one of the main points that that I find so interesting about quantum logic is is that, of course, in logic we have the very first definition of an entity in metaphysical terms, you know, ontological and logical terms by by Aristotle, in terms of the principle of existence, the principle of non-contradiction, and the principle of identity, the principle of existence. Allowing us to talk about existence, the principle of non-contradiction, allowing us to 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 discuss an existence in terms of non-contradictory properties, and the principle of identity, which allows us to to discuss about this entity which has non-contradictory properties, in, in terms of an identity to itself through time. And and this is essential for physics, right? Because in physics, what we want is to define a state of affairs, something that remains the same, even though it changes. So in order to have a dynamic, a dynamic evolution, you require to, to, to have uh, the possibility to define a moment of unity. And this is one possible moment of unity, the, the one defined in terms of this logical and ontological principles. By Aristotle, one that has a very deep relation to Newtonian mechanics, because of course, as we all know, the propositions of Newtonian mechanics obey a Boolean structure, and and so uh, it contains to some extent uh, the, the the main structure of, of, of classical logic itself, in in what respects to 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 the reference of of the theory. That there is this quotation I like very much by Karim Fedels and Bob Kuke, dropping Aristotelian metaphysics while at the same time continuing to use Aristotelian logic as an empty reasoning apparatus implies therefore losing the possibility to account for change in motion in whatever description of the world that is based on it. The fact that Aristotelian logic transformed during the 20th century into different formal axiomatic logical systems used in today's philosophy the science doesn't really matter because the fundamental principle and therefore the fundamental ontology remain the same. This empty logic actually contains an Iliatic ontology that allows only for static descriptions of the world. And this relates, of course, to, to also to, to, to the, uh, we could say, erase, erasing of the potential level that is also present in Aristotelian metaphysics. In this elemorphic scheme between the potential and the actual. So in Newtonian mechanics, the, the, the potential realm was completely erased, and what is left is an actual realm of existence, uh, which is defined in, 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 in these terms. And 
hear someone else who uh, also makes reference to this relation to, to actuality as defining entities in classical physics. Uh, Dennis Dix, in classical physics, the most fundamental description of a physical system, a point in phase space, reflects only the actual and nothing that is merely possible. It is true that sometimes states involving probabilities occur in classical physics. Think of the probability distribution rho in statistical mechanics. The occurrence of possibilities in such cases merely reflects our ignorance about what is actual. The statistical states do not correspond to features of the actual system, but quantify our lack of knowledge of those actual features. So in the case of, of quantum logic, of course, we know that uh, this was uh, a work undertaken by Birkhoff and von Neumann for the first time in, in, in during the 30s, in a, in a famous paper, uh, The Logic of Quantum Mechanics from 1936. Uh, and, and, and here, I would like to make the, 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 my first comment or remark regarding uh, quantum logic. There is a very specific way of considering uh, quantum, quantum mechanics after the work of Dirac and von Neumann in terms of actual properties. And these actual properties are defining operational terms in, in, in the case of, of quantum logic as uh, properties which can be certain in, in, a, in a certain specific basis. So the, the, the link between uh, logic and empiricism here is, is, is quite direct. And th th there is a kind of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, mixing of two rather distinct definitions of actuality, one in terms of an actual state of affairs, a, uh, uh, in terms of a mode of existence, and the other in terms of a here and now uh, actuality, uh, uh, an observation, an event. And, and this, this distinction, which is uh, essential, has led to a lot of problems also in quantum logic. Basically, because uh, one could say that uh, quantum mechanics might be talking rather about a potential realm rather than an actual realm, and also in, in relation to, to the fact that uh, rather than talking about measurement outcomes, quantum mechanics seems to be talking about intensive values. But of course, this is a discussion about uh, within the, the, the context of philosophy of quantum mechanics and, and the possible interpretations that one can, can address in this case. So in this, in this paper, uh, something which we also do with Graciela Domenech and Hector Freitas is uh, a kind of map that discusses the different paths. So I just want to go uh, very fast through them. I, I don't have much time left. So it, it's just to, to give an historical grasp of, 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 the, of quantum logic, of the history, of the very rich history of quantum logic. And well, the, the, the possible future developments that can take place. Of course, we have the, the Neo-Kantian path, which goes back to Heisenberg, and of course, uh, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. Uh, we have uh, Peter Mieterstadt, Holger Liede, who worked on, on, on this line of, of research, uh, which later on was also developed by Michel Bidbeau, French philosopher of physics. We have uh, the quantum logical operational approach that goes back to George Mackay and Andrew Gleason, his student, and of course, Yao Chen Piron. Diederik Aerts is a student of Piron, who, who uh, developed also in, in Brussels a school of its own. And uh, th there are two students who also worked uh, after Dirk Aert. I, I'm, I'm also a student from, of, of, of Dirk Aert, uh, Bob Cook and Sonia Smets. 
working in 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 England and Holland at, at the moment. Uh, we have, of course, the, the the debate about quantum logic being or not empirical. I take addressed by David Finkelstein and Hilary Putnam. Of course, model interpretations. I, I'm also a student of Dennis Deeks, and uh, Dennis Deeks has has been uh, one of the developers of uh, the model interpretation together with Bas van Verassen, where the, the, the notion of, of, of potential is, is, is understood as in terms of, of model logics. Uh, well, the, there is a lot of discussion in this context about the meaning of modality in, 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 in physical terms. Jeffrey Bubb also developed uh, another interpretation in quantum logical terms of uh, also called model. That, as a matter of fact, it, it, it's it's an interpretation of David Bond's in, in line with David Bond's uh, uh, field interpretation or, or uh, very well known for me mechanics. Uh, we then I'm running out of time. The, we then have the, the Czechoslovakian and the Italian schools uh, with Pavel Tak, Anatoly Duricenki, and Silvia Pumanova. Enrico Beltrametti, Maria Luisa de la Chiara also developed a, a, a line that continued with Roberto Giuntini, Francesco Paoli as well, in, in, in Cagliari, the Italian school. Then we have the Brazilian school with uh, Newton da Costa and Desio Krause. I, I've uh, worked as well with them. And uh, I, I would like also to mention Jonas uh, in this in this group. And then uh, of course the, the paper continues. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through it because I'm out of time, but it, it goes into the, the different developments of uh, and debates that are taking place today in, in, in different quantum structures in, 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 this, in this sense. Well, the, 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 the International Quantum Structure Association uh, has been uh, very essential. And I, I would like to finish with a, with a quotation by Dubrichenki, where he says, in the early 90s, a new organization called International Quantum Structure Association was founded IQC gathered experts on quantum logic and quantum structures from all over the world under its umbrella. It's organized in regular biannual meetings, Casti Castioniello 1992, Prague 94, Berlin 96, uh, Liptovsky Mikules 98, Cesantico 01, Vienna 02, Denver 04, Malta 06, Brussels, Skansk 04, uh, Kokovce, 09, Boston, year 10, Cagliari, 2012, Olomouc, and 2004, 14. Uh, in the spring 2005, uh, Dr. Bai, Kurt Gessel, Daniel Lehmann, and Jan Spur had an excellent idea to ask experts on quantum logic and quantum structures to write long chapters for the Handbook of Quantum Logic and Quantum Structures. Okay, so so that's I think a good ending to my presentation. Janiv, Francesco, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. So um, there is uh, time for a discussion about this uh, presentation and also more generally about IQSA. So if any participant has questions, so please either announce your question in the, in the chat by writing, for example, Q, or simply <clears throat> unmute yourself and ask your question directly to the speaker. So please. Well, uh, I will have a very general question. Um, by the way, I put the link to the to the entry to the, of the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy on the chat. People want to have a look. But this entry was uh, written by uh, by Chris Durand. 
And uh, my, I have a very general question. What is exactly, uh, because sometimes it's not very clear, uh, as you were saying, you, you are a physicist, of course, mm -hmm. and it's not clear that uh, many people working um, in, uh, in quantum uh, physics know about uh, quantum logic. So that's my question. What exactly is the interaction between uh, physicists working in quantum uh, mechanics and uh, logician working in quantum logic? Well, I, I would say that quantum logic is part of philosophy of, of quantum mechanics. We, we would say it's, it's part of that development. Well, it, it's, it's very uh, unconnected to physics. I mean, I mean the, the, the connection, it, 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 As it stands, the connection between physics and philosophy is 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 almost nothing. So, so that, that that's a huge problem within within the contemporary research. I I, I think that that's a, a very interesting point to address because, as a matter of fact, the findings that 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 have been developed in in quantum logic, but not only in quantum logic, in, in foundations of quantum mechanics, in philosophy of quantum mechanics more specifically, because foundations can be understood as part of physics more, more, more than as part of philosophy. Uh, well, they have not been acknowledged by physicists. Physicists work on their stuff and philosophers work on their stuff and there is no connecting line. And I'm, I'm very sorry to say that that's, that's a huge problem in, in, in contemporary uh, science, the, 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 the radical fragmentation that we have in, in, in the different very closed uh, parts of, of, uh, of science. Well, as a matter of fact, philosophy of quantum mechanics is not even considered as, as, as part of a scientific uh, discussion by, by many physicists. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm very sorry to say that uh, we have a problem there because of the, the, the the connection is 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 is, is very it, it's not very very direct. Okay, uh, I, I would like to add one more thing. So you you were just saying that uh, well that quantum logic is part of philosophy, but in some sense it's a bit strange because uh, as you uh, you were saying today and as it's presented in your uh, entry, you say that the official birth of quantum logic was produced uh, with uh, 36 seminal papers, The Logic of Quantum Mechanics. And uh, the, this paper was uh, written by uh, Birkhoff and von Neumann. Birkhoff and von Neumann uh, are considered uh, rather as mathematicians than uh, uh, as a philosopher. I mean, uh, so uh, there, is, uh, there is, I mean, uh, this, this quantum logic is based on some mathematical structures. There is also this, I mean, we have to see this uh, relation with, between two, three things. I mean, the physics, uh, philosophy, and also uh, the mathematical structure of um, this, uh, this quantum logic. Yeah, sure. Uh, of course. I, I mean, I mean it, it, it relates very much to also, also to, to, to a kind of mathematization of physics that took place in, in, in the 20th century. So, 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 so indeed, quantum logic is, is, is very much also related to, to mathematics. The, the, the International Quantum Structural Association has, has a lot of mathematicians working on, on, on quantum structures in abstract terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so yes, uh, I, I would say, just, just to add uh, a comment with respect to, to, to this, this connection between uh, logic, mathematics, and, and, and physics, and philosophy, that, that, that quantum logic is, 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 is a fantastic uh, field of, 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 of debate, which connects all these points, all these dots, the, the, the physical part, the mathematical part, the logical part, the philosophical part. And, and uh, for that reason, I, I think it has been very, very interesting uh, to, it, it, it's a very, interesting way to, to try to understand quantum mechanics, at, at least also the limits with respect to classical, our classical understanding in, in, in logical terms and also in metaphysical terms. Uh, 
I, 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 I do think that, that, that there is uh, some future in, in quantum logic if we are able to develop and, and, and think anew this, this, this logics uh, for, for, for quantum mechanics and for, for, for the future developments of quantum mechanics, quantum information processing in, in, in particular. And um, uh, what is the evolution of, uh, of quantum logic? Are there more and more people or less or less people working on the field? Today, we will have a talk about uh, natural detection from quantum logic. So it's uh, really uh, something is going on. We, we have a research paper on this topic. But in general, uh, since you are working on this field since many years, how do you see the evolution of the, of the research on this topic? Well, I mean, this is very personal question. I, I have a kind of, uh, I, I, I do not see there is a true development in, in quantum logic specifically. That there, there is, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, getting to some kind of limit. I, I think there is a problem, a very deep problem in relation to, to to the reference to actual properties that grounds quantum logic. I, I, I see there uh, a deep problem and the, 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 the fact that quantum logic has been grounded on, on the Dirac von Neumann uh, formulation of quantum mechanics, which has a lot of problems. It, it has a lot of problems and it very, it's, it's essentially inconsistent in many senses, in operational terms, in, in terms of, uh, philosophical terms, in logical terms as well. And, and to some extent, these this problems have not been completely acknowledged. So, so, so I would say that uh, I, I, I see with, with not, I'm not very optimistic that, uh, that this is in, in, in general with respect to, to science and philosophy in general. So, so it, it's, it's just one opinion between many. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, in the meantime, there have been a few questions in the chat. So one participant asked, where's the paper you presented available? But this question has been already answered. And there is uh, a link you can find in the chat if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're interested. And then there is another question that I'm going to read. And then if there are no further questions in the meantime, we will close the discussion and uh, uh, go on to the, um, uh, to the main talk of, of this session. So the question is uh, asked by a second year PhD student working on a thesis in quantum logics, uh, who asks, uh, uh, well, uh, he thanks you very much for these activities and asks if, if there's an official website of the IQSA. Yeah, sure. I, I, I... I can I can send it to you. I I, I will put it on the chat. Let me... Okay, thank you very much. And uh, so there is uh, a further question now. How can we solve? So a participant asks, how can we solve deep problems about nature, like understanding the relation between gravity and quantum theories and perspectives? without resorting to philosophy and quantum logic. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, physics requires philosophy and philosophy requires physics. I, 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 I think that they are uh, a unity. If, if we are going to discuss about knowledge, uh, then uh, we require philosophy for sure. And physics is deeply connected because, because of the of its reference to, to, to nature. But I'm I'm alone in this, or almost alone. I mean, I mean the, the, the orthodox perspective, the orthodox contemporary perspective is that uh, these two things are completely distant. And uh, you, you even have a lot of physicists claiming that philosophy is dead or that philosophy of physics doesn't have anything about on physics or is completely unnecessary 
And uh, well, with respect to this, I, I, I would like to point that it is a metaphysical debate like the one undertaken by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, and also by Schrodinger, which developed the notion of entanglement, right? And the, the notion of entanglement has become uh, one of the main concepts in quantum physics. And physicists have learned to accept that, that this debate on, on philosophy of quantum mechanics that, that was taking place in the 70s and 80s, also in terms of quantum logic, very, 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 very importantly, uh, were essential even for physics, even for an instrumentalist conception of physics. Uh, uh, entanglement has has become, uh, I would say, the, 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 the star of quantum mechanics and in, in for quantum information processing. So this, this, as a matter of fact, shows very, very explicitly the connection and the, and the need of metaphysical debates, philosophical debates, logical debates within physics. The, the, the fact that instrumentalism has gained completely uh, the, the physical research is, is really bad for physics. It's, it's, it's really a bad situation because that closes the doors. In, uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't discuss entanglement for 50 years because everyone followed the idea that everyone everything had, had been solved by Bohr. Thank you very much. So meanwhile, a participant showed this support saying you're not entirely alone, I'm with you. And I'm sure that many more people share this opinion, although maybe the majority does not, but I'm sure that the minority is strong enough to guarantee a future for this debate. So uh, let me thank again uh, Christian de Ronde for this very interesting presentation and uh, now proceed to introduce Professor Kenji Tokuo, who is the main speaker today. Uh, professor Kenji Tokuo is a professor at the National Institute of Technology in Oita in Japan, and his uh, research interests lie in the foundation of quantum theory that he has been investigating under different aspects, like the proof theory of quantum logics, quantum set theory, quantum number theory, uh, quantum computing, and uh, uh, let me add that he also has a deep interest in the philosophical aspects of uh, quantum uh, theory. Um, um, let me uh, invite the speaker now to share his screen. Professor Tokuo, can you hear me? Ah, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, would, you, would you like to share some presentation? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So the title of the, this talk will be Natural Deduction for Quantum Logic. So please. Thank you, Francesco. Hi, Hi I'm Kenji Tokuo from Japan. I'm very pleased to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting me today. And I'd like to talk about my recently published paper, uh, which has appeared in Logica Universalis. The title of the paper is Natural Deduction for Quantum Logic. The paper is available online the journal's website. And the paper is a little bit technical. Uh, and if I go through the details from the beginning to the end, uh, everyone here might get bored. So uh, in this talk, I'll, talk, I'll focus on the background uh, outline or uh, main contributions of the paper. So uh, let's get started. And uh, first of all, I'd like to give you a brief 
summary of the paper. And this paper presents a natural deduction system for osmodular quantum logic. The system is shown to be provably equivalent to Nishimura's quantum sequence calculus. And through the Curry Howard isomorphism, quantum lambda calculus is also introduced, for which strong normalization property is established. And the main contributions of this paper is as follows. This paper presents a natural deduction system for osmodular quantum logic. And thanks to its intrinsic and straightforward appearance, we can understand the meaning of inference in quantum logic deeply by comparing the system with those for other logics. For example, intuitionistic logic or classical logic. And uh, we can also introduce the corresponding quantum lambda calculus, which allows us to further investigate computational theories based on quantum logic by the curry howard isomorphism. We can establish a desirable property regarding normalization of proofs or equivalently termination of computation. Then uh, I would like to mention some related, some of the related studies. As an earlier study for quantum natural deduction, we need to mention Delmas Rigotus double deduction system, which incorporates a concept of compatibility into a natural deduction system for classical logic. And differently from this approach, we define a natural deduction system that directly corresponds to GOM, Nishimura's quantum sequence calculus. Besides GOM, a few systems for quantum sequence calculus have been proposed by Kaplan and Gibbons and Nishimura again. And furthermore, an extended logical system containing quantum logic called basic logic, along with its sequence calculus, has been studied by Sambin et al., uh, Fajan and Sambin, and Dara Kiara and Jutini. These systems, however, are all inadequate for being translated into natural deduction forms due to their complex treatment of negation and cut. The quantum lambda calculus introduced in this paper is based on osmodular quantum logic, while several other systems based on intuitionistic linear logic have also been studied under the name quantum lambda calculus. The proof of the strong normalization property presented in this paper follows that of Gerard et al. And in this part of my presentation, I'd like to talk about some problems I ran into in developing the natural deduction system for quantum logic. And I, I'd like to talk about uh, how I dealt with them. Uh, it is known that quantum logic has no satisfactory implication operation, as in the case of intuitionistic logic or classical logic. Indeed, Nishimura's GOM 
only adopts conjunction and negation as a basic set of operations. On the other hand, it is almost inevitable to include implication in the basic set of operations for the purpose of developing a natural deduction system and the corresponding lambda calculus. Oh, sorry. Can you see? Okay. And to handle such a contradiction, we employ the Sasaki hook, a kind of quasi implication as one of the basic operations of our system. Although it fails to satisfy the deduction theorem, the Sasaki hook still enjoys some expected properties of implication, such as modus ponens. Another problem that we encounter when associating GOM with a natural deduction system is how to treat assumptions in a deduction process. In the usual natural deduction system for intuitionistic logic or classical logic, assumptions that are not used in the application of a rule may be omitted. That is, uh, for example, uh, look at this diagram. In this case, it is legitimate that assumptions other than alpha are not explicitly stated, even if they exist. The point becomes clear when we express this situation in the sequent calculus form. Here, all undischarged assumptions other than alpha are explicitly written as gamma, a possibly empty set of formulas. In quantum logic, however, the introduction rule of implication, uh, the Sasaki hook, is subject to a restriction due to the failure of the deduction theorem. That is to say, the introduction rule of implication can only be applied if there exists no assumptions other than alpha. For comparison, let's look at these two uh, diagrams side by side. The left side shows the introduction of implication in the intuitionistic or classical case. And while the right side shows uh, that in the quantum case. So in the form of sequent calculus, the difference is obvious. Taking this restriction into account, we will use the following convention in defining and applying the rules of our natural deduction system. The assumptions that are not explicitly stated must not exist. Uh, when written in this style, the, the introduction rule of implication in intuitionistic logic or classical logic will become as follows. Uh, look at this picture. Uh, you must write this gamma. Even if you don't use uh, gamma uh, here, so introducing implication, you, if you you don't use gamma, you must uh, write gamma here. And here, in order to compare the usual style of natural deduction with our style, uh, the left side is the usual style and the right side is our style. And you must write gamma here, uh, assumed at this point, even if you don't use it to introduce uh, this implication. Uh, 
And this is an example of a whole proof diagram. This is made in intuitionistic or classical logic. But the same proof diagram is now illegitimate, is not legitimate in quantum logic. Uh, look at here, uh, labeled A, small a. Uh, you can't infer alpha implies gamma from gamma. Uh, you can't infer this in quantum logic uh, because at this point, the assumption uh, this labeled B is still alive. This assumption is eventually discharged, uh, but at this point, uh, the, the assumption small b is still alive, so you can't, uh, you're not allowed to apply the introduction of implication rule here. And indeed, the conclusion formula uh, is not a theorem of quantum logic. This means uh, transitivity of implication, but this does not hold in quantum logic. Once a natural deduction system for quantum logic is obtained, the corresponding quantum lambda calculus can be introduced by the curry howard isomorphism. The proofs of the natural deduction system can be reversibly translated into the terms of the lambda calculus, respectively. And finally, we will prove the strong normalization property for the quantum lambda calculus, which claims that any computation in the quantum lambda calculus eventually terminates. Uh, so much for the background stories. So I'd like to move on to the main uh, main topic of the paper. And this is the organization of the paper. And section two gives a uh, formal definition of our natural deduction system. And we named the system NQ. Uh, so this section is uh, devoted to formal definition of NQ. And we employ conjunction and implication as the basic connectives and introduce the following as abbreviations. Uh, disjunction uh, and uh, negation as usual. And we now inductively define a proof of NQ. Uh, this is assumption rule and this is a bottom rule. Uh, small a is a label uh, attached to an assumption and bottom rule means you can infer any formula from the contradiction. And the next, uh, these are the elimination of conjunction, uh, right, uh, left and right. And this is the introduction of conjunction, uh, quite natural. And this is the elimination of implication, and which is a well-known modus ponens rule. So uh, we use Sasaki hook, so modus ponens holds uh, with this 
implication. And this introduction of implication is the uh, rule that best characterizes NQ. Uh, this is the most important. As I said before, uh, no assumptions other than alpha are allowed to be made when this rule is applied. And this is modest tolerance. Uh, this means from alpha implies beta and uh, this means not beta. Uh, then uh, we can infer uh, not alpha. And this is the, the elimination of double negation. And this is the introduction of double negation. The definition of NQ has been completed. And in the next part, we will verify that this definition is indeed valid as a quantum logic. And in section three, we prove the equivalence of NQ and GOM. And this guarantees that our NQ is indeed a proof system of quantum logic. And now let's take a look at Nishimura's G second calculus, GOM. Here's the axioms and rules. Sorry. And a distinctive feature of his system lies in the treatment of negation. As you can see, the negation right rule is different from that of classical sequence calculus. And we also need additional rules for double negation and Orthomodularity law. Orthomodularity law is uh, important because uh, it is equivalent to modus ponens, so we need this orthomodularity law. And in GOM, we regard alpha implies beta as a shorthand for uh, this formula and it means the Sasaki hook. And additionally, we regard bottom as a shorthand for uh, alpha and not alpha. Alpha is an arbitrary formula. And for this GOM, we proved two theorems, uh, these two theorems, theorem 3.5 admissibility of the rules of NQ in GOM, uh, which says the rules of NQ are provable in GOM. And the next theorem, 3.6, admissibility of the axioms and rules of GOM in NQ, uh, which says the, the axioms and the rules of GOM are provable in NQ. And due to these two theorems, the proof theoretic equivalence of NQ and GOM has been established. And here we have used the following fact, proposition 3.2, or modular, uh, which means also modular law, also modularity, can be replaced by the following MP rule, which means more exponents. So uh, we have proved in the paper uh, this equivalence. So we see that osmodularity plays a very important role, essential role here. And 
let's now turn to section four. Now that we have obtained the natural deduction system for quantum logic, so we can come up with a corresponding uh, system of lambda calculus via the Curry Howard isomorphism. Here is the definition of types. And here is the definition of lambda terms. What is important here is a kind of lambda term called lambda abstraction, the top of this list, lambda x point m. As in the case of natural deduction, uh, only one assumption is allowed. This is important point. And here are the theorems that show the correspondence between NQ and quantum lambda calculus. Theorem 4.6, Curry Howard isomorphism between the formulas and the types. It says there exists an isomorphism between the formulas of NQ and the types of the quantum lambda calculus. Uh, there is uh, one, one correspondence. And next, theorem 4.7. Uh, Curry Howard isomorphism between the proofs and the terms. There exists an isomorphism between the proofs of NQ and the lambda terms of the quantum lambda calculus. We then look at the correspondence, correspondence between the simplification of proofs in natural deduction and the one-step computation in lambda calculus. Uh, we can remove uh, such detours in proof diagrams. Uh, look at this picture. This is called conversion of proof diagrams or conversion of lambda terms. And this is another type of conversion. So you can remove these detours here. So uh, elimination immediately after the introduction. And one more definition uh, on double negation. And as for convergence, the following definition is important. Definition 4.9, normal form. A lambda term or a proof is said to be in its normal form if it can't be further converted. A lambda term is said to be normalizable if there exists a conversion sequence that starts with itself and ends with its normal form. And in section five, we proved the strong normalizability of quantum lambda calculus. Intuitively, this means that any computational procedure of quantum lambda calculus cannot go on forever, but must stop at some point. The proof is very technical and will not be discussed in this presentation. The proof essentially traces what Girard did for the usual lambda calculus. Uh, definition 5.1, strongly normalizing. Uh, lambda term is said to be strongly normalizing if there exists no infinite conversion sequence that starts with itself. And theorem 5.2, strong normalization the lambda terms of the quantum lambda calculus are strongly normalized.
and in conclusion, let me sum up my main points. In this paper, we have presented a natural deduction system for orthomodular quantum logic and the corresponding lambda calculus. Proof theory and computational theory for quantum logic have not been thoroughly studied so far. One of the reasons for this is that quantum logic lacks a satisfactory implication operation. And by treating the Sasaki hook as a quasi implication and adopting it as a basic operation, we have obtained a straightforward formalization of natural deduction for quantum logic and the corresponding lambda calculus. And we hope that both systems will contribute to the study of proof theory and computational theory for osmotra quantum logic. And that complete my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, I uh, already have some questions in the chat and uh, I will read them to start the discussion on this uh, paper. So one participant says that the restriction of the introduction of implication means that in practice, there cannot be contexts of more than one variable. Otherwise, the final terms in the calculus would be open terms. Uh, why the rules have that many different contexts? For example, we can make the pair of two lambda abstractions, but not a lambda abstraction taking two arguments and producing the pair. So the rule for the introduction of conjunction should be just with one assumption for both components of the conjunction. Uh, I apologize with the person uh, uh, who asked the question if I made some errors in reading. Uh, so um, please, uh, um, please Kenji. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Ah, sorry, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I have to admit there is a strong uh, restriction, uh, so, in performing proofs, uh, we are restricted and uh, so for, there are many obstacles to carry carrying out proofs. But uh, what, what do you mean by the arguments? Is, is this about lambda calculus? Maybe Alejandro, if you can hear me, it could be useful if you unmute yourself and uh, maybe interact directly with the speaker. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you, you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the, the, the question is just that uh, in the in your uh, the, the logic that you are presenting in the natural deduction, uh, for example, when when you show the introduction of the of a conjunction, you have a two two contexts, two uh, well, two uh, set of assumptions, one lambda uh, gamma one and gamma two, and then from these two assumptions you you derive two propositions and then you do the, the conjunction. But uh, but at the end you cannot discharge these assumptions. You can only discharge 
one because of this restriction that uh, that you mentioned for the implication. So the question is why why you are putting more assumptions than those that you can discharge. discharge. Uh, in that case, you will have a proposition with a, a set of assumptions, but uh, you are not able to discharge those assumptions. So finally, you cannot do much with that. So when you pass to the lambda calculus, your lambda terms only have one variable. So uh, all the, the other assumptions have to be open variables. You cannot uh, discharge them in the lambda. So uh, what I am, what I mean is that it is equivalent if you just take uh, all all the other rules, not only the, the the introduction of the implication, all the other rules with only one assumption, and every derivation has to have only one assumption. So at the end you get a lambda term. But in that case, the 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 things that you can derive are uh, not not much. I mean, you only can derive something with one assumption and whatever you can deduce with one assumption. Is that correct? So, uh, if, if we transfer to lambda characters, so uh, there we, we are allowed to use only one assumption. So, uh, as uh, lambda characters, we can only use one variable and other yeah. other variable uh what what should we do for other variables uh, so your, your question is so second or third variable how to treat how to deal with the other assumption right uh, yes, it's more like a, 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 I, I don't see the point of putting, of allowing, uh, for example, the conjunction to have many assumptions if at the end you only have, you, you can only have one assumption. So why why to put the, the, the gamma one and gamma two in the conjunction if at the end what you can do is always a proposition with only one assumption? Yeah, I have, to, I have to admit that uh, it is a strong restriction. So in practical, the proof uh, may stop or uh, we can't uh, carry on proofs, maybe. But uh, I, I have not yet investigated the uh, concrete computation examples. So uh, I can't answer that question immediately, but uh, I, I have to admit that it is a, uh, there is a strong restriction and uh, th that is the quantum logic, maybe. Okay, okay. Th thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Alejandro, would you also like to ask your, your second question in the chat? Yes, but uh, I think the, the, he already answered it because uh, he he said he uh, uh, Kenshi said he didn't uh, try uh, yet uh, to do computation uh, on this calculus. So I guess uh, you cannot encode uh, a quantum algorithm on this calculus, especially because uh, you only have one variable. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's clear. Okay. But, uh, Okay, so thank, thank you. you. So let me proceed to the next question in the chat, uh, which is uh, uh, the following. Is your implication rule restricted to only compatible propositions? So you can only apply it in a single measurement context uh, uh, with, uh, with a question mark uh, again. So is this the, the origin of the restriction in the implication rule? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. And uh, the first question, uh, my implication rule is uh, not restricted to only compatible proposition, but all, all propositions uh, 
yeah, uh, some other uh, studies, in some other studies, uh, they uh, they sorry they present a system uh, where the implication or something is only uh, available to uh, compatible propositions. But our system uh, is uh, in our system there is no restriction uh, the propositions are compatible or not. But so we can use uh, in you can use implication with any propositions. And the second question is uh, so origin of the restriction uh, is the so quantum logic is uh, non distributive. So distributivity uh, of conjunction of a disjunction fails and the restriction of implication comes from non-distributivity. Uh, uh, my, our system has no disjunction operators, but uh, disjunction and negation are related to implication uh, via the definition of Sasaki hook. So our, our restriction of implication rule comes from non-distributivity. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. I would like to ask the participants if they have further questions or remarks. So maybe while uh, participants are um, thinking of further questions, let me ask you uh, one. So uh, this is basically a clarification question because uh, I, uh, I understand from your presentation that your calculus is equivalent to Nishimura sequence calculus in a very strong sense, meaning that you implicitly gave an algorithm for translating uh, proofs uh, in Nishimura's calculus to proofs in your natural deduction calculus and vice versa. So my question is this, uh, uh, Nishimura's calculus is not cut free. So if you take a, a counterexample to, to cut elimination uh, in, uh, in Nishimura's calculus, meaning a, 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 you consider a sequence that can only prove the with cut, but not without cut, and you apply your algorithm, then uh, I suppose you end up with a natural deduction proof that is not uh, normalized. So my question is, how can you uh, um, address this case uh, to obtain a normal proof? Uh, I, yeah, it's an interesting question. And I, I don't think of the cut elimination, uh, I, I didn't think about cut elimination. So uh, I, I don't have an idea now, but uh, yeah, uh, your, your opinion is right. And so Nishimura's second calculus is uh, 
doesn't have cut elimination property. And so our natural deduction system uh, is normalizable. So what is the relation between the two? Is, is that your question? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I suppose maybe maybe the the normal proof that you get for such uh, you would get in a calculus for uh, for such a for such a sequence would not arise as a translation of any proof in Nishimura's calculus. So my question was uh, uh, if um, there is uh, a, 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 so how how can you address uh, these uh, these cases? Um, yeah, but maybe we can uh, also discuss this via via email in um, yeah. uh, in the next days. Okay, so thank you. Uh, meanwhile, uh, okay, so Janiv put in the chat the announcement for the next Logica Universalis webinar, which you can see. In, uh, in the chat, and uh, let me um, let me ask the audience if there are further questions or comments. Okay. Let me wait 30 more seconds. Well, it looks like uh, there are no further questions or comments. So we thank our speaker again. And uh, uh, maybe Janiv, uh, uh, would you like to conclude uh, this uh, this session? Well, uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Thank, thank you very much, Kenji, for your nice talk. And uh, I put the information on the on the chat about the next session, which will be uh, September seven with David Mackinson. So everybody is welcome to join us uh, next month. And meanwhile, <laughs> I wish. Happy holidays for all people who are on holidays now in uh, in Europe and uh, North America. In Brazil, we are uh, during the winter here, so we are we are at work. <laughs> and uh, thank you again to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.